I, I, I cursed myself because of the title, the daily mail. Because daily means you have to update it daily, and that's a lot of work. I hated myself for it. So, let's see that works. Good. So, today I'm going to talk to you about nonsense. And, I mean, we're in a perfect time frame um, to create nonsense. Because we have computers. And on computers you cre can create amazing stuff. Now, my little kid, she got this uh, new game computer. And on it there's this game. And there she can create her her own world, and she can make her own house. And in this house, she put a television. And she's watching television on her little game console. Why? Of course! That's what people do. They watch television. It's, I think this is wonderful nonsense. So my seven-year-old can create wonderful nonsense now. And that's, of course, amazing. Now, adults, they do create nonsense as well. A few years ago, some of you were probably on Second Life. It still exists. And a friend of mine, he's still there, and he creates the most bizarre nonsense. And I think this is, I mean, where, what's the name of the thing? Yeah. Oculus Rift. In Second Life, oh fucking shit, what? And looking like a gnome. I mean, this is amazing. <laughs> so this is the stuff that we can create with computers, and that's wonderful. But, um, alas for you, I'm not going to talk about this amazing stuff. I'm going to talk about art. Things that I created on the web. Useless stuff that I created on the web. This is a beautiful site by Jen Schiffer. You should all visit it. There's some very nice art projects on it, um, where she looks at old artists and then looks at how she can generate their art and tries to write JavaScript to generate this, this art. It's really, really good. Um, I'm not going to talk about JavaScript either, because I don't know how to write JavaScript. Sorry about that, if you came here for a JavaScript talk. Um, that one we had before. So why do I like nonsense? Well, the reason is because everything is useful. Everything we do in our society lately needs to be useful in some way. I mean, that's, that's a bit of the mindset that we have here in the Netherlands and I think in the whole Western world. Everything should be useful. And if you look at the definition of useful, it's able to be used for a practical purpose. Uh, where I used to work, uh, a big agency in the, uh, in the Netherlands, they had a different definition for useful. It was more able to be used for a financial purpose. Um, it's a slight different, but this is, I think, what you see in the Netherlands a lot. If it's not economic, then it's not useful. So if there's no way to make money with it, there's no reason to do it. I mean, you see that at the university in, the, in Amsterdam, the reason why the students um, are unhappy, or some students and some uh, uh, lecturers and some professors are, are unhappy, is because these tiny study, studies that don't really make any money or are not clear how to make money with them, they just get kicked out. Uh, so the only thing that remains is things like economics and making stuff with computers, because somehow we still think that's useful. <coughs> okay, so as a reaction to this um, agency that I was working, I thought I need to do something with useless stuff. So I created this website uh, where I celebrated wonderful creations like this one. I don't know if you know this one, defiantdog.com. It's a picture of a dog with a button, sit. And of course, everybody presses that button to see what happens. 
what would happen? What do you think? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, nothing happens. So you pr press it and nothing happens. It's not entirely true. Nothing happens. Nothing seems to happen, but every click gets recorded. It's in uh, Google Analytics. So I contacted the, the author of this beautiful piece of art and I asked him how many, w w what happens? What do people do? They click, I thought, 30 times? 50 times? People just keep clicking. Maybe something will happen. It's, it's beautiful, beautiful. Uh, things like this, classic art. Uh, I celebrate this. This uh, is art by Onkavara. And almost every day for, I think, 50 years or something like that, he painted by hand these date paintings. I mean, this is something that we do now a lot with Quantified Self. We have apps to do this for us. But he did this by hand. Beautiful stuff. That's stuff that I celebrated on this website. Uh, friends of mine, they knew that I hate QR codes. Not really because they're not, I mean, they're useful. I mean, that, that's not the reason why I hate them. I think they're really ugly. So one day I came home, and on my wall, there were all these QR codes. And what the fuck is this? And my wife is standing next to it, proud, because she, she put that on the wall. And she didn't tell me what this was about. So I had to take pictures. I had to download the QR code reader. And, then, and all these QR codes went to a beautiful picture of the Rijksmuseum site. Uh, and my friends also knew that I think the Rijksmuseum site is the best site, maybe the best site ever made. Um, my, my little kid, she was five back then, she took my phone and she started taking pictures of this thing and it didn't work and it frustrated her and I showed her, no, you need a, a different program. And she thought that these were the most beautiful things ever because when she took a picture of a QR code, she saw a beautiful picture of a, a swan or a little duck or something else. So we came outside, and then we saw this little van from a, what's a, an aannemer, what's an aannemer in English? A contractor. And there was a QR code. I said, oh, look, daddy, look, daddy, there's a QR code. And it opened up on my little screen a desktop site of this contractor's website. It was terrible. OK, so I celebrate this stuff on this website of mine. And I designed it. Um, I'm not really good at designing, so I kept it minimal, but I thought this is too minimal. It needs something. It needs an illustration, but I'm not an illustrator. So I wanted an, an illustration right here, um, and I wanted a different illustration for every um, article. But how do you do that? Well, luckily, I found this beautiful font called Bagaros. These are, this is a font without spacing, so every next letter is put on top of the other letter. So it says Rijks Vasilis right here. So every article has its own illustration. That's beautiful. I think that's amazing. So somebody came up with that and it looks beautiful, especially when you look when you use a little bit of transparency. It's it's very nice, very nice effect. So this was done. And then at the same Frontiers conference um, there was um, Paul Irish and he was talking he showed WebGL for the first time. So we saw WebGL and we saw this tank of fish swimming round and round. We were all, wow, this is amazing. And then he pressed on the letter L on his keyboard. And what happened was lasers came out of the eyes of the sharks. And he said, more sites need lasers. So when you press the letter L, on this side, lasers come out of the eyes. <laughs> and this was back in 2010. And this was the first time that I worked with CSS transforms. And there's a little bit of, I think, box shadow in there. And this was the first time that I used this. So this was very useful for me while I was working on nonsense. I did some useful stuff. So people didn't use this back then because we had old browsers that didn't support this. Um, it works. It's beautiful. Let me show you. <laughs> That's wonderful. I still like it. So, 
Okay. I also use proper markup to mark up the, the, the monsters. I mean, it's an, with an unordered list with lasers in them, so deaf people can enjoy this as well. <laughs> um, deaf, blind people, whatever. <laughs> Back it was regular. This is the font. <coughs> it's hard to find now. It, it used to be uh, uh, posted everywhere. And what you can see here is that I used um, relative units. Because if I used pixels, then I couldn't do something uh, very useful, something that the web is very, very good at. And that is sizing stuff. So what you see here is that on this breakpoint, the little illustration goes into the content and it gets a little bit smaller. Now, it gets smaller and the only thing I have to do there is make the font size a tiny bit smaller and every, but everything resizes, including the lasers. So if I use pixels, I would have to uh, make a lot of extra code. And this just simply works small and big things. There are other um, places where this is very useful. For instance, here, this is a proper website um, with a big font size on a big screen. And if you make it a little bit smaller, then the font gets smaller. This makes sense in a lot of situations where you want to keep the text readable. It is a good reason to make uh, text smaller. But I want to keep the, uh, the ratio between the headings and the text, of course, I want to keep that the same. So instead of using pixels to uh, uh, set the size of all the text, I just use M's. And it's very easy to do this with a little media query. Here's another one. Uh, I think this is also a good use case that sometimes you want to make an aside a little bit smaller. <coughs> um, very easy. <coughs> by just simply setting the font size of this thing a little bit smaller. Very easy, very flexible. This, this is stuff that I found out while creating nonsense. Useful stuff. Other things I learned, I learned these nice selectors. We couldn't use those back then because we had IE6, IE7, and I see still some older developers who still don't use these because they learned how to write code back then. These are nice. Transition delays are nice. These are just wonderful. RGBA, where you have this alpha channel to create a little bit of transparency. Um, and this is also something that I learned. You should use all the new stuff that we have in the browsers and just don't care about if browsers don't understand it. They will understand it. So just create from the, the top browsers and make a nice fallback for the older ones. No problem. Okay, so I like creating stuff for the web. I really do. And I like creating uh, nonsense for the web. I also like creating physical stuff. Some of you might know this illustration, beautiful illustration by Mike Cuss was published in um, uh, the mobile book by Smashing Magazine, beautiful book. Um, and this was about responsive web design, the illustration. And I really liked the illustration. We had a very boring uh, wall in our hallway at home. So I thought, I'll paint this illustration onto the wall. And so I did. It's a lot of work, really a lot of work. And as the designers here see, I failed because the white space here is not big enough, right? You see it now. Now that you see it, you can't unsee it. Well, this was on my wall. Damn, it should be like this. <laughs> on computers, that's not much work. You just, you know. But in real life, this is really, really a lot of work. Because I had to open up Illustrator, adjust this thing to make it a little bit smaller. I didn't know how that works. I'm not an illustrated guy, so that was a lot of work. Then I had to send that to the laser cutter to make new uh, uh, stencils. Ask my daughter to please get off my car so I can drive to the laser cutter, get these physical things, drive back home, and paint every ball back onto the wall. But this is really, really a lot of work. It took me a month to get this on the wall. Now I'm very happy with it. It looks good. All right, 
there are some stains on it now, but it, it's still nice. It's nice to look at. On the web, this is easy. So if you have this problem that something is too big on the web, as you saw, it's not that hard to make it smaller. You simply <laughs> resize the font size. You make it smaller. This looks nice too. Eh? <coughs> the way Chrome does this. I get into an endless loop. So I created this website to thank my Cus because he created this uh, illustration. So I made semanticresponsiveillustration.com for him where I recreated this uh, website for him. Um, now the beautiful thing about the web is that this is really, this, this, this thing doesn't change on my wall. It will always be the same. But if we have a smaller um, screen, then we can decide to make a different Well, you get the point. I mean, this thing should turn around as well, but it doesn't. We can adjust the image. So this responsive design, we all know responsive design. And you can use this for, um, for these kind of things as well. But what should we do if rounded corners are not supported? So this is done with border radius. And as you all know, Opera Mini doesn't support those. So what should we do? We could, of course, make it look like this. But it is an illustration of balls, so it doesn't make any sense to make it look like this. So instead, because I used semantic HTML, I can make it look like this. I mean, it's not really beautiful, but I mean, somebody with right, an artist who sees this can go, I can make up something even more beautiful than the thing we saw. And if this artist is as lucky as somebody with IE8, which doesn't support RGBA or HSL, I don't remember which one I use, they'll see this. And they can even make up the colors. I mean, that's amazing. That's wonderful. I really like that of the web. And that is because I used these, of course, semantic HTML. I really like that. I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, should probably have used SVG here, but this is so much more fun. Um, you can also listen to the web sound. So even if you're blind, you can still imagine the colors and shapes. Um, the fallback can be better than the real thing. I mean, that's what I learned here. That's especially what I learned from this very useful uh, exercise. I also painted my car with uh, cardboard paint. And there's some sort of a, I mean, the white space here is definitely too big. But this is not too much work. So instead of having to repaint the whole car, I just wait till it rains, and then I do it all over again. Um, this is the closest you get to control Z, command Z in real life, I think using chat. Okay. The company that I worked at, um, they thought we need to make apps because everybody needs apps, mobile apps. And so what did they make? They made all these applications that you had to shake. Nobody does that. Except us, we did that. So I created this thing <laughs> that when you shake it, it starts talking. You can't see it here, but it does. So it talks bubbles. I cannot shake my computer, so I thought this is silly. And that was a silly thing about these apps. They only work on a device you can shake. Um, doesn't make any sense. So I thought, okay, you don't have to shake. You can also just tap on it or click on it, and it will work. I, I mean, I created this more for my daughter and for myself. 
Okay. For myself. I created it for myself. It's not for my family. Okay, nothing. That was a side uh, Paul was talking about. A friend of mine, a colleague of mine, he started a <coughs> freelance business. So he stopped working for the big agency, started working for himself. And I was a freelancer once, a long time ago. And the thing that I really, really enjoyed from freelancing is the fact that you work for a month and you get a lot of money and then you can just do nothing for two months because you're loaded. Nothing. I mean, that's the thing I really liked about being a freelancer, being lazy. Oh, wow, that's amazing. You still have money. Um, so I created this website for this friend of mine, One Nothing A Day, which generates, it generates one nothing a day. So nothing in a different color and a different font. Um, and I was discussing this website. This website went on for a few years. So there were all these nothings generated there. Uh, I was uh, discussing this with a friend of mine, and he's a real minimalist. He created the, the website Minimalissimo, which, which was one of the best websites. Um, and he said, this is not nothing. This is not a good website. I mean, it should really generate nothing. And it should look like this. <laughs> so we sat there and we, we started thinking, so how do we create this site? So how do you make a website that looks like this, but it, it should generate something? I mean, I can make a blank uh, page. So create, we created Amor Vacui, which means uh, we love the void, we love emptiness, we love nothing. And as you can see, it looks like this. You can also see here, there's a scroll bar. <laughs> this one has been generating nothing for a long time, over a year now. Every day this website generates a white square of random dimensions. And it puts it right here. I'll just, I made this hack where you can see the background and here you can see the white squares. This friend of mine hated this hack. He said, what? This is, this is so ugly, black background. <laughs> so this is uh, what we did. And then, of course, I thought, well, this needs to be semantic as well, I mean, uh, or semantic accessible. People have to be able to do something with it, to, 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 to read it. And I also wanted to publish it to Twitter and to Flickr. And I think Flickr, this is the best website. It looks good on Twitter as well. So every day, every midnight, somewhere at midnight, when it's really black outside, you get this white rectangle. And it publishes the size of the white thing with a link to the white thing. And I think the Flickr page is really the best. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, did you see what happened? It, fetching more, in, <laughs> fetching more images. <laughs> so it has a this has an RSS feed as well. The page. <laughs> you can make your own apps with it if you want to. So this is. The stuff I learned from here. Oh, yeah, this is interesting. We'll come back to that later. So, creating stuff while asleep. You know, I like doing nothing. My computer doesn't work for me, so my, my server generates this stuff for me. I don't do anything for this. I haven't, I haven't touched it for over a year. So, okay. I quit my job, went home. I didn't have to talk to this minimalist colleague of mine anymore, so colors. And I don't understand colors. Uh, I only understand white, um, uh, black and white. That was what I understood. So I thought, OK, how can I try to understand colors? I said, OK, and I now know how to generate random rectangles. Maybe I can generate random rectangles with a color on a colored background and see if somehow I will then understand 
if it works, if it doesn't work, if it's beautiful, if it's not. So I started doing that. <coughs> and I created the daily rectangle, um, which looks that looks like this. It's a long, long page. It has been going on for over a year as well. It has its own Twitter account as well. Yes, its own Flickr account. Um, it creates one random rectangle every day of a different color. And I thought, well, maybe I can just understand color. I don't really understand color. It's not the best way to learn how color works. And while I was working on this, I was thinking, how can we best generate random numbers? I mean, we could do this. Does anybody know what this means? Yes? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, okay. So some nerds, I was expecting some people in here, or at least one person in a room like this to know this, but in the rest of the world, nobody knows what this is, and they shouldn't. I mean, this is really for computers, it's, it's, it's anti-human, I think. Same for RGB, it's also too hard to understand. I mean, I don't know what happens if I do something red. I don't know, I really wouldn't know. Also not for humans. But there's a, a third way uh, to create color, and that's HSL. And that's really, really nice. This is for humans. If you understand it, I mean, <laughs> more or less for humans. Anyway, you can do human stuff with this. So, for instance, you can slide this thing and you can try to create the same color as the background over there. I don't know. Somewhere like this. I mean, this is, this is human. I mean, you have three sliders, and you can just make a color. It, it works the way that we see color. I really love it. This is, this is what we should be using. The best thing about it is that you can actually translate it to human language. So we can make a sentence out of it. We can say this is blue and it's rather saturated and it is light. And that's what I did. So I created this uh, little library. Well, it's actually more or less a, an array. What is it? Yes, not even an array. It's an if-else statement. Not even else. It's only an if statement. This is the most code, code you'll see. Um, and it just says, between this and this, it's blue. And between this and this, it's lime. And right here, it's yellow. Um, so I created this library. And the good thing about it, why I really, really like this library, is because this makes the daily rectangle accessible. So it says. Below, you can't read it, but a highly saturated, almost black green rectangle, very white and not so high, on an unsaturated, almost black background, red background. <laughs> so I can really translate this stuff for humans. We, we, we can now listen to this website instead of just look at it. I think that's one of the most wonderful things about the web, that there's not just one way to look at the web, there's many ways to consume the web. We don't know how the people who look at our website, how they will consume it. They might listen to it, they might look at it, they might have a very, very crappy monitor uh, where this is yellow, it does exist. And they can still read, but it should be. It's nice. <laughs> I think it's... And the best thing, of course, is that I put it on GitHub, and within a few hours, somebody created a Python version of it, and somebody else created a JavaScript feature, uh, version of it, so you can all use it in your preferred language. Uh, looking for translations as well. So if you know any other uh, language, <laughs> you're welcome to contribute to this wonderful library. Okay, so 
that's colors. Now I needed more layouts. So I had all these rectangles, the one on top of the other. And sometimes I wanted to see these rectangles, the one next to the other. So how do we do it? How do we do that? Um, of course, I could write some complex PHP code and put a, a question mark here and write some gibberish behind that and create a new <coughs> layout. Or I could do something with JavaScript. Then I thought, no, I have CSS. There's no reason to use any of that very, very complex stuff. I can just simply put a hash here behind. And use the target CSS selector. You all know the target CSS selector? That's wonderful. You can make different layouts with the target CSS selector. So this is the first one I created, uh, which uses uh, multi-column layout, which is also awesome. You should all use multi-column layout. Then there's this one, which uses Flexbox, and it shows all the generated images on the whole screen. So that's all of them that are generated so far. Tomorrow there's one more. And the day after, there's another one. So this is another layout, and then there's the third one, which is for people who hate images and hate colors. That's the text-only version. Um, also, with this is more for um, for the purpose of this talk. I created this. One. Okay. So how do we do this? This is so I used. The target CSS selector, and the target CSS selector is really wonderful. You can do all this amazing stuff with it. So what I did is I put an ID on the HTML element, and now I can say that the body should use multi-column layout with 15 minimum, maximum size, minimum size, don't remember, never remember what this means. <coughs> Something, maximum or minimum, not more than 15 AM, DM. With this is all I needed for this multi-column layout uh, to create this. I, mean, I think this is very nice. I really like this one. Uh, multi-column is actually really, really nice. So you can do stuff like this with it. Almost no code needed to create this. You might know Blendl. Uh, Blendl does this. Blendl wrote, I guess, one kilometer of JavaScript to do this. I wrote three lines of CSS to do this. You should use the right te technology, I think, if you want to do stuff. Um, here's another one. I really like uh, using uh, multicolor layout for pictures. So if you have a lot of pictures, instead of ordering them one next to the other, you can order them <coughs> like this. Uh, and the nice thing is that old pictures come popping up every now and then. So it's, that's an element of surprise. Uh, what's this? Well, of course, for very, very long lists, like this one, multicolon is also very, very good. And the nice thing is, the, the, really the best thing about multicolon is, is, yes, it does generate some sort of breakpoints that we are used to, like it, it gets extra columns, but you don't have to write any of those media queries for it. It just works. It does this thing for yourself. So the computer does the work as it should be. We humans should be doing nothing. We should be telling the computer do the work for us. That's where multi-column layout is excellent for. It does the job for us. Um, Flashbox Similar, so the other trick I did, I put an ID on the body, so that's where I can get the other layout. And now you should start thinking, how did you do that third layout? So I have this, this little bit, it's this easy to fill the whole document with all the elements that you have in the page. It's really, you should start using Flexbox as well. Mm. Cares, right? And you should be using these. Vmax, these are beautiful units. Wow. What's Vmax do? It's uh, the maximum size. So 
it's either the height or the width, but the bigger. So in this case, it is 5% of the width. And if the uh, screen is higher, then 5% of the height. So the result depends on landscape of Yeah, I'll show you what happens. So this, <coughs> if I resize this, you see right now it starts changing because and here it doesn't. See? No? <laughs> I guess you should start working with it. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's really a nice unit. It's this, the VMAX. Is, this is actually the first time that I really used it in real life. With Vmin, that's the other one, you can create a rectangle that's always an exact square. That's what you can do with that. Uh, VH uh, is beautiful, we'll get to VH later. Okay, so then there's the last one. Oh yeah, I should lose it. Okay, margins. So right here, for instance, you can see that the, the height here of the, the white space is dependent on the height of the browser. So that's nice if you want to create classic looking layouts which, which are actually, which are uh, based on the size of the screen or, or of the canvas instead of the size of some fictional thing that we made up. Uh, another one, but this is very nice where you can use the, you can use it for, for uh, font size as well. So we can now create poster-like images where this is related to the size of the screen. Which is really, really nice. <coughs> and this is actually a brilliant site created by, um, well not by me. And the thing is, on the background, this is a live version of Amazon.com. So if you buy all the crazy stuff, you probably shouldn't show this one to your clients because the, the cookies will show you all the crazy stuff you buy. But this is, the, the, these few relative units are absolutely amazing. You can use them for images as well. It's pretty clever. So you can say, I always want people to see the, the caption below here. So I can just set this to 90% of the viewport height and always make sure that people will see that there's something below here. You can also use it to do something like a little trick here, so this hamburger icon, it has some sort of a max font size. So I use media queries for that. <coughs> Try to figure out how that works, I'm not going to explain it. So the third one, how did I do that? I put an ID on the head element and I used the sibling selector to create a new uh, uh, layout. I never thought of putting an ID on the head element, but it's useful, right? Okay, so that's layouts. Then I thought, okay, now I know how to make a rectangle, I know how to generate colors. Does color you work the same way with blobs? And I didn't know how to create a blob. That was the other reason why I wanted to investigate this. So I created the daily blob, because I wanted to know how this works. How do you create a blob in SVG? Uh, well, it turns out you type a long sequence of numbers and it creates a blob. Um, and you need Bezier's for it, but you should really let a robot do that work for you. If you really want to understand, there's this excellent article I link to, I will put this online later on so you can read this. It's a beautiful, beautiful article. Where is it? Here. I mean, look at that. This guy is amazing. So he created all this stuff. Brilliant stuff. You should, you should actually just read this instead of me trying to explain this. And then I had this blob, and then I thought, okay, what would it look like if this blob transforms into a rectangle in different ratios? It looks pretty good, actually. 
I'm very happy with this result. This was the first time in my life, I think, that I created something. I said, holy shit, this is beautiful. <laughs> so unfortunately, I don't smoke weed anymore because, whoa, 20 years ago, I would have been amazed. <coughs> Did I create this? So this is another one that I created, the blob that turns into a rectangle. Then I created this one. I think this is real. I just wrote some code. This creates itself. So I sleep and I wake up, and this is there. It's just there. I don't do anything for it. It's pretty nice. This was generated today. <laughs> Looks good, right? This is a slice of a block. <coughs> so I just experimented a little bit. And then I thought, OK, OK, this stuff gets generated. Let's make some money out of it. So all these things are generated. They, these are files, they're actual files. So there are PDF files. I also I created SVG files, PDF files, PNG files. Everything gets uh, created. And then, uh, OK, so I can now just put a button next to every item. And people can buy this stuff and print it and have big prints on their walls. Yeah. That sounds like a great idea. So I created this shop where you can buy rectangles. Really, really a lot of rectangles. <laughs> They've been going on for over a year, so lots of them. And there's more. I mean, it's, it also generates books. Every day a book is generated with 100 random rectangles in it, or blocks, or whatever you like. And so, and I went on a holiday this summer, and I did absolutely nothing. It was wonderful. And when I came back, there were, I don't know, 150 new works of art generated for me. I thought that was the best thing. I did nothing, and it was just there. <coughs> so you can buy all this stuff, books about blobs. And if you look at these are the sales numbers, it looks good, right? Well, <laughs> I, I cut this off deliberately over there so that it looks like it keeps scrolling forever. But this is it. <laughs> <laughs> and I also cut off this here because it says who bought the stuff, and that's me. So <laughs> I didn't really get rich of it. It only cost me money because I keep buying these presents for friends of mine. <laughs> That's nice. It's free. It doesn't really matter. I mean, who cares? So what did I learn? Multicolor is very, very nice. And the other thing I learned is people don't care about rectangles at all. <laughs> <laughs> or not enough to buy them. I mean, that's, that's, that's clear. So what about? the other dimension. So this was all flat. I mean, you cannot really interact with it. There's not really much you can do with it. And that's time, of course. This is time. This is uh, another project I did. This is the Greek time clock. So in Greece, if you have an appointment with somebody, they will be there on time, give or take an hour. So this is a Greek time clock. It is the exact time right now, give or take an hour. <laughs> maybe an hour later, maybe an hour before. <coughs> so that's the Greek time clock. It changes every two minutes. <laughs> um, but no, when we talk about time, of course, we talk about animations. And we saw some fantastic stuff before about optimizing animations. That's what we really think about when we uh, think about animations. So how do you do animations uh, on the web? Of course, with jQuery, right? Because <laughs> I mean, you probably know this one. So there's this guy. I have got a number in my JavaScript variable. Now, how do I add another number to it? And the answer, you should definitely use jQuery. <laughs> and I got upvoted 22 times. And here's the real answer, and I got downvoted. <laughs> So use jQuery. That's the first answer about how to animate stuff. Use jQuery. That's the way to go. Of course, we have CSS and 
we have smell. That's interesting. I want to create something with a smell. Uh, well, let's make an animated blob. So I created an animated blob. <laughs> nice, right? <laughs> it's just blobby and blobbing. But I found out how this works. So this was really only an exercise for me to understand how does this work. Uh, it's pretty easy. So this is the CSS animations. We know how these work, right? You all know CSS animations. Pretty easy. You give it a name, and then you can set percentages. You can do other stuff with it as well, but this is what I did. You can set percentages, and so this way I generate 100 different backgrounds, and it keeps animating those. This is the interesting part where you can say how fast it should animate, 1,500 seconds. It should go on forever, of course, and it should be a linear animation. It's pretty powerful stuff, actually. You can do a lot of stuff with it, and this is just touching the, 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 the very basics. There's lots more. You should read the book by Leah Veru, definitely. Uh, all of you should read it, because that's a really, really, really good book. Smell works similarly, but it's SVG. Uh, it's, you all knew this, of course, synchronized multimedia integration language. You, it's, that's why I made it small. You all knew this. Um, you put an animation inside an element, and it animates the attributes. So it's really easy. You can set durations. You can do a lot of stuff with it um, indefinite repeat count. I mean, it's all a bit different. And then you, you have a, a semicolon <coughs> separated list of things that it should animate. It's not really rocket science, but again here, I think you should let a computer do the work and don't type these animations. It's really something that robots are much better for. But with animations, we always talk about 60 frames per second. Things should be fast. And I created this, this blob. And I put it on my BlackBerry Playbook. I, mean, I don't know if you have a BlackBerry Playbook. It's a, beautiful piece of hardware, but it's really useless because there's no, nothing you can do on it. It has a, a browser that's okay, so I put this thing on it and it worked, and I put it in my, uh, I hung it on my wall so I can look at it like a work of art, and it's, now it's useful, it has, has value again. But I got crazy from this blob that's moving there, I didn't want to see this moving thing all the time, so I thought, I'll create a slow animation. So right here, what we see here is the slice of a blob that turns into a rectangle, which slowly animates in 24 hours, and it animates from one shape to the other 100 times in 24 hours, I think. So if you don't look at it for a while, and then you look at it again, you see something else. But if you like what you see, you can enjoy it for a minute doesn't change uh, really fast. So this is nice. Actually, I, I look at it a lot. I have these two old, uh, old uh, tablets, and I look at this. But I thought, this is not slow enough, is it? So I created a very slow animation. And this is the same thing, but this changes 100 times in 100 years. So this is an animation of one century. So I will never see the 90th state. And when I refresh this page, it starts all over again, and it generates new things again. So this is somehow a bit of a frustrating uh, thing. The weird thing is that this one, while well, I thought, I mean, nothing happens. There's nothing happening. Nothing's animating. But this just gets my computer crazy the vans start blowing, and this is a really fast computer. If you know why, I don't know, maybe it, it, will, it tries to put every single frame into memory, something like that, for one whole century. 60 frames per second. <laughs> but maybe that's why it's, the vans are blowing, I don't know. 
So anyway, don't use SMIL if you have a very long animation <laughs> of a century. It's not really performative. Uh, slow animations are slow. <laughs> SMIL. Um, all right. So let me conclude. Why should we engage in nonsense? I have been uh, uh, saying it a, a few times, but I think because robots, and I really believe that robots one day will take over our jobs, which we can say, oh, that's terrible, they take over our jobs, and now we don't have a job. We can also say, yeah, they take over our jobs, so we don't have to work, that's great. Let them do the stupid work and let us relax and do nothing and make nonsense, right? I mean, that's another way to look at this, uh, um, this thing. You should watch a movie. There's a link to a movie. I won't play it for you. It's, it's not that long. It's 15 minutes, but it really explains that even creative work might be done in the near future by, uh, by robots. And I'm not sure if I uh, dislike that. I like the idea, I mean, the, probably how it gets implemented will be terrible and horrible and we'll all die of hunger, but the idea right now is actually pretty nice. So, I hope in the future this is a perfect pastime for everybody. Watch TV on your Nintendo DS while you're in a house or something. And this should be a perfectly fine thing to do all day long as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. The, one, yeah? Any questions? No. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. Oh, that was great. Thanks. Um, well, I want to thank, of course, the speakers, uh, Silas and Bet over there. Um, I have two gifts for you. Uh, thank you. Um, Beth. It's a uh, beer glass. Uh, beer. Good. Uh, Amsterdam beer, of course. <laughs> Not a Belgian beer. But thanks. It's an IPA. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank Netflix and Sebastian, of course, for hosting the event. I want to thank all their sponsors, individual Google developers, um, Frontiers, and Beyond Tellerant. I want to uh, thank Leah for, <coughs> for videotaping and helping me organizing this event. And I want to thank you for being here, of course. Um, as I said, the next event is not going to be in May, it's going to be in June, probably in Amsterdam, but um, I'll keep you posted through meetup.com. So thank you, have a few drinks and some snacks, and I hope to see you next time.